must learn to work together as a global community. And we must regain belief in that nations can be united in working things together as United Nations. Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 27 years we have offered voices of conscience, key issues in ethical perspective. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and moderator of today's program. It's my pleasure to introduce the third speaker in our spring series, Perspectives on America, Election 2008. Jan Eglin has been described as the conscience of the world. For more than 30 years, he has worked to support the one billion people in our world who struggle daily to survive poverty, conflict, and natural disasters. In his role as the UN Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, he coordinated international relief after the Indian Ocean tsunami and the South Asian earthquake. He has led efforts to relieve victims of civil war and ethnic cleansing in the danger spots of the world, negotiating with guerrilla leaders and warlords in Sudan, Congo, Iraq, Lebanon, and Colombia. He has held executive positions with Amnesty International and the Norwegian Red Cross, and served as State Secretary in the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Currently, he is Director General of the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs and the UN Special Envoy for Conflict Resolution. In his recently published book, A Billion Lives, an eyewitness report from the front lines of humanity, he bears witness to the crushing needs facing the global community, and he challenges the leaders of the world's most powerful nations to end the massive suffering that is taking place under our watch. The means exist, he believes, but it remains a matter of will. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Jan Eglin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. It is a, an honor to be here in this beautiful church, speaking from this important pulpit. For me, of course, uh, things have really changed. When I uh, earlier left my office, as I, I did all the time, I went to the worst places on earth and I met uh, warlords and dictators and guerrilla leaders and mass murderers. When I now leave the office, I come to a wonderful place like this and meet wonderful people like you. The warlords didn't like me. I didn't particularly like them. It is much nicer, believe me now, to be able to have a dialogue with you. I came here to the American Midwest myself the first time more than 31 years ago when I was 18. I had, as a 17-year-old in Norway, uh, watched television one late night coming from handball practice, and a, a, a Catholic father in Colombia said through Norwegian television that he wanted European youth to come and work with him in social justice work in war-torn Colombia. Uh, we flew on the cheapest ticket possible, three friends from high school to Canada. We took a Greyhound through here, ended up in Chicago, bought a second-hand car for $1,200 and drove it 30,000 miles to Panama, from where I went myself on alone to Colombia, where I worked with an Indian uh, tribe the Motilones in the jungle and with the um, peasant cooperatives in the mountains. The war was raging then in Colombia. The same war is raging today in Colombia. 31 years later, it is, if anything, worse today for the civilian population. And it is, to me, 
one of the examples of how it should not be on our watch. In our Western Hemisphere, we let a war, a humanitarian catastrophe, a, a drug problem, a refugee problem, a human rights problem, just fester and stay on and on. And perhaps the biggest mistake we've done is that we've learned to live with it. Now, why write this book, really, called, called A Billion Lives? Well, when I left the UN eh, at the end of 2006, after three and a half years as the Global Emergency Relief Coordinator, all of the journalists who asked for this goodbye interview said, we know you've been to 100 countries. We know you've been to all nearly of the wars and disaster zones of our time and age. Do you leave depressed and disillusioned, or do you leave very depressed and disillusioned? <laughs> and then my answer was, listen, I'm an optimist. I, 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 I know I've given you a thousand interviews of what was wrong in these situations, and I obviously have not been able to communicate that I saw we succeeded more often than we failed when we came together as humanity in a united nations to help in the front lines of humanity. In the tsunami, we woke up the second day of Christmas in the year 2004, and every hour I got worsening news of 12 countries having been hit on two continents and more than 200,000 people had been killed in a minute by this gigantic tsunami wave. It was nature as its worst, but it became humanity at our best. 90 countries helped. 35 militaries came, not to fight war, but to help save lives. The US sent a, 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 a helicopter carrier that saved us when we had no communications, no logistics, and we needed to get our doctors, our nurses, our relief workers into Acha, Indonesia, immediately. Nobody died in the tsunami-stricken areas because of hunger, because of epidemic disease. And in the end, we were able to get enough money to cover all emergency leaves and to rebuild all homes and all infrastructure for everybody. In the Pakistani... Uh, <laughs> Similarly, and less well-known, in the Pakistani earthquake, when I came the fourth day after the earthquake, we, the assessment was that 3.3 million people were without a home, and there was four weeks to the Himalayan winter descended. So in all previous generations, they would have said, well, let's see how many will survive when spring comes next May. This year, 2005, we didn't give up because the Pakistani people, the Indian people on the other side of the border, and the whole international community was willing to help. We could use new technology, we could use all of the resources available, and when we did a survey this May, nobody, uh, the mortality had not risen above a normal winter. There was no uh, nutritional uh, deterioration. More girls went to school that winter than in a normal year in Kashmir because of the relief efforts. And much of that was done with American non-governmental organizations and American money. So we can do all of this if we want to. The world is getting slowly but surely better for a majority of us. 
There is 50% more peace, less war today than there was when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. 1989, there were 10 unfolding genocides. Today, there is one or two. In the 1980s, or, or, or take 1970s, when I traveled from here through Central America with all its military dictatorships, many of them supported by the then uh, US uh, foreign policy, uh, at that time there were 10 to 20 military coups in the world every single year. Now it's between two and four. At that time, 20 million children died every year from preventable disease and malnutrition. Now it's less than 10 million. Still, I call the book A Million Lives. And why is that? Because tonight, still a billion fellow human beings will go hungry to bed. They will not have had access even to safe drinking water today. They will live in fear for arbitrary violence, and they will have to survive tomorrow on less than one dollar. So my point is, when two billion people now live in affluence in this world, including the good, generally the good people of Minnesota, and certainly everybody here in, in my own country of Norway, but also in, 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 in Asia, in Latin America and elsewhere, where there is enormous economic growth, these two billion should be able to lift up the one, I mean, if you have two billion people living on, on $100 a day, they should be able to lift up those living on less than $1 a day. I'd like to spend my last minutes of trying to sum up all of these 31 years of international efforts of mine and my 100 countries that I have visited in 10 lessons learned. And I think the first lesson is prevention is better than cure. We can prevent human suffering if we invest before the tragedy comes. The tsunami, the 220,000 people should not have died in the tsunami. There should have been an early warning system. There was no early warning system in the Indian Ocean because nobody had invested in it, as they had for the Pacific Ocean, where Japan and the United States saw it was in their interest to make it. Or in Darfur, we should have listened to us, the humanitarians, who said in 2003-2004, that a small conflict was exploding into a horrific human tragedy, but it could be prevented because there was a ceasefire that could have been implemented if there had been interest. Time and again, we see that the world is not willing to prevent the human suffering that is becoming such a rampant thing for those who are the most vulnerable. The second lesson which is connected to that is that we must learn to work together as a global community and we must regain here in America as in Europe, as in Asia, as in the Arab world, as in the Islamic world, regain belief in that nations can be united in working things together as united nations. The, there, I mentioned all of these progress we have had. I mean, in, in, in my time in the United Nations, peace broke out in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Angola, Burundi, uh, in South Sudan, in Kosovo, in East Timor, and it is today in Northern Uganda. 
Why? Well, because uh, local forces, regional forces, global forces for good in the United Nations went together. And let me also to, to try to explain how cost-effective it is. Liberia was a place in, hor in a horrific civil war. You will remember. Li Liberia has a special place in the hearts of America in the sense that this were, these were liberated slaves who, who, who came to Africa and helped create Liberia. That's why it's called Liberia. There was, for a number of years, this terrible civil war with, where child soldiers specialized in killing each other. The U.S. then led the effort to establish a U.N. force consisting of African and Asian nation mostly. It cost $1 billion a year over ooh, four years, more or less, to build peace that today holds with a wonderful female democratically elected president. The United States paid 26% of this bill every year. Japan, 19. Uh, I think uh, Germany, 7, 8%. So for $260 million, the United States really led an effort that was spectacularly successful. How much is $260 million? It is the same as 10 hours of costs this year of the United States in Iraq. So it's not, you know, it's not like you or we are bankrupting ourselves working through the UN for peace. My third lesson is that we need predictable action on the humanitarian side, political peacemaking side, security and protection side simultaneously. And we do not have that at the, at the moment. At times I find perhaps that we on the humanitarian side became so effective in, in going to places like Darfur, where there today is 12,000 humanitarian workers with 1,000 trucks having distributed 2 million tons of food, most of it from America, that we've become so effective in holding people alive that those who should concentrate on healing the wound through political action and protecting people through peacekeeping action are, are, are not necessarily doing their job. To me, it, in many ways, Darfur is like the safe areas of Bosnia all over again. People, the people of Srebrenica did not starve. They got food every single day through Norwegian convoys, uh, heroic civilian uh, dry, uh, uh, truck drivers came with food every day shelter, schools even. And then they were all massacred because the militias around were not demobilized. So the predictability of security and political action means that the United States, China, India, the Europeans, South Africa, the world leaders have to come together and say, this cannot go on as it is. We need to agree on how to end it because it's no natural disasters. It's no, not a tsunami. It's man-made from A to Z. Now, my fourth lesson is connected to that. We need and we can and we must set ourselves ambitious goals then to end these remaining wars to end these remaining disasters, this remaining abject poverty. I describe in the book how we were four Norwegians who set ourselves the goal to connect the Israeli government and the Palestinian Liberation Organization for the first time ever. And we succeeded. We organized in deep secrecy a small group of Norwegians 13th rounds of secret negotiations in Oslo, which led to the Oslo Agreement, which was a very hopeful roadmap for how to provide peace to one of the 
worst conflicts of our time and also one of the more dangerous one because it leads to so much hatred far beyond Jerusalem and the holy places that we, they are fighting about. Now, <laughs> as I feel we should not administer the crises, but we should solve them, of course we then also need, which is my own bitter lesson, to have consistency in carrying through these ambitious goals of ours and not just have events like, unfortunately, the Oslo Agreement became. And here's, of course, as you discuss, America's role in all of this. You know, America has, in my view, a historic mission and obligation to stay on the Israeli-Palestinian peace effort, not only every last year of every presidency, but throughout the presidencies, because it's a very difficult effort. And, and, and it's very clear that the parties themselves cannot do it. I, I think it, it, it's amply clear that with all of the military responses, yesterday's terror attack, yesterday's missile, yesterday's incursion, will always follow another violent act on either side. And now there is less security for young Israelis and Palestinians than there was 20 years ago. Now, to to, to be able to fund all of these activities and all of the follow-up and the implementation and the prevention, of course, my fifth lesson is we've got to be more generous also as a, a rich world which is getting richer and richer and bigger and bigger. I famously uh, uh, uttered the word uh, stingy once to, to characterize nothing to do with the tsunami, which was ultra generous by everybody. But on a question following the tsunami, which was, the, which was this, could it have been prevented? And I said, yes, there could have been an early warning system and they, we could have made these people less vulnerable through development assistance. And secondly, the question, would it take now attention away from Africa? And I also said, yes. There is a tsunami death toll every five months in the Congo, year after year after year. Imagine that. Five million people lost since the war broke out in, in 1998. So, when the world then provides the rich countries on average 0.18 percent of their riches, you know, it's, it's not enough. And never did I read in any scriptures, holy, holy scriptures, neither the New or the Old Testament or the Quran or anywhere else, that one should keep 99.82 percent to oneself and give 0.18 percent <laughs> to combat the biggest moral efforts of our time and age. We have to become more generous, all of the rich countries, including the new rich countries in Asia, in the Middle East, and elsewhere. Sixthly, we need to control arms proliferation. I mean, the small arms of our time are in many ways the arms, the real arms of mass destruction. The Kalashnikov now that was made in the Ukraine in 1957 when I was born is still wandering from war to war in Africa. And it could well be in Somalia being used against civilians today. So the other side of this is of course that the, the real weapons of mass destruction can now be, be made by by irresponsible governments, by terror organizations who can get the prescription, the recipe on the internet and who can buy all that is needed on the black market. Now, <clears throat> my seventh lesson 
uh, which I do describe quite a bit in the book, is speak the truth always. I mean, the, there are so many forgotten, neglected emergencies. There are so many communities of people who are voiceless in all of this. And if we do not speak, what we hear, what we see, what we smell in the front lines, well, who will? Because to me, it brought me in trouble many times. There were five heads of state uh, coming after my scalp, really, uh, when I was in the UN. But I was always defended by the Secretary General, who said, listen, can you prove that the guy, this guy is wrong? And when they couldn't, I was able to describe it as it is in these war zones, and who are to blame, and who did the violence. And that leads us also to the possibility of holding leaders, military and political, accountable. Eighth, which is connected with this, we also then have to focus more in our action on the neglected. I mean, the, the tsunami was great. The world was fantastic. We gave more to the tsunami in three months than we gave to all other wars and disasters all over the world for the rest of that year. And, and the tsunami was just one of, 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 of the challenges that year. We need to be, as I said, predictable in French-speaking Africa as much as we are in the Middle East or in the Balkans or in places that are strategically important for the West. My ninth point is one which I could have spoken on for an hour, and I now uh, have to conclude, so it, I would have to, to, to be very pointed. The biggest cloud on a horizon which is relatively blue, the biggest cloud is climate change. And it's not, it's not debatable anymore. It's, it, let's stop the debate about it. There were uh, 6,000 scientists sat in the international, the global panel on climate change from the United States to Europe to Asia to Africa, and they catalogued climate change beyond doubt. Now, just one point here. Those who are most vulnerable, who are suffering the most already, are those who contributed the least to the change. I mean, Europeans and Americans really put a lot of garbage out in our atmosphere now for two generations. The, 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 the farmers in the Sahel in Africa put nothing. They are the ones who see that the desert is, is growing and that there is less grazing land and, and, and more difficult to, to even get wars to end there. Or, or people at small Caribbean and Pacific islands who contributed nothing to this see that there is a sharp increase in hurricanes as a consequence of this. There are three times more natural disasters in this decade than there was in the 60s and the 70s because more vulnerable people are more exposed to extreme weather than before. My tenth point, and finally, I think we have to be, as we are, to succeed in making this last leg on this ma long marathon to make the world predictably better. We have to be ruthlessly self-critical in terms of ensuring quality control in our work. And that goes for the UN, which is still ineffective, badly organized, badly structured. Uh, I remember the, the, the conclusion of, a re, of, a, of an evaluation of operations in the, in the desert-stricken Africa in the 1980s, and the conclusion was at least the poor, the vulnerable, the sick, the dispossessed should have one final human rights left, and that is to be protected against incompetence from the do-gooder. And of course, it, it, it's one of the things I've really, really seen on my, on my road here. 
you know, if you, if, you, if you make soap, you may make good soap or bad soap. If you're a lecturer, you may have a, 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 a lousy one today, or you may have a good one today. But if you do organize peace work, relief work, your success is measured in human lives. So you cannot afford to not be at your best, and you cannot afford to not be accountable, not only to the donors, but even more importantly, to the people that you are there to help. Okay, so I end just saying before we discuss all of this, I remain an optimist. I mean, if my generation, I'm now 50 and a half years old, if my generation, you know, half asleep and half-hearted was able to make progress on so many fronts, what is not possible for the generation now, now in school, uh, good representatives here present, if they use this, these resources, public and present, uh, public and private that we now presently have. We use the technology and use the tools, which are the excellent organizations, channels, methods that we have at hand. And the sky is the limit. It's a question of will, political will, economic will, of generosity, really. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan Eglin. You are listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, originating from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister at Westminster Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is diplomat and humanitarian Jan Eglin. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience at Westminster, I'd like to thank the forum's many supporters, especially the co-sponsor of today's event, the Minnesota International Center. We're also pleased to welcome to our studio audience today, students from Minneapolis Southwest High School. We invite you all to join us for our next Town Hall Forum on Thursday, April 10, when Oz Guinness will explore the case for civility, living up to our American ideals. Information on these and other programs is available online at eWestminster.org. Jan Eglin, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. Could you say something about what you have observed of the role of religion in the world's conflicts that you have been involved in? Uh, I would say that religion is key in many ways. It's key to the solution, but it's also often part of the problem, really. I, I would uh, venture to say in, uh, in, in Latin America I've seen much of the best action for good, for peace, and so on, is the church. If, if there is one thing often the, the guerrilla and the government can agree on, it is let's ask the church that is coming as do-gooders, help us make peace. In the Middle East, I, I would, maybe it's controversial, but I would say it's been the other way around. I mean, fu fundamentalists on three sides have come in time and again and said, no, we don't like this. I mean, we read the scripture, we read our scripture, which is not your scripture, and we are 100% right, you're 100% wrong. Please understand that we're 100% right, and we will fight for that forever. It's not good, it's not good, and it's not the way, you know, I uh, was brought up as a, I was a Lutheran, uh, I am a Lutheran, uh, Norwegian. We, we tried to also be taught that, listen, maybe, maybe they are right, really. And, and, and that uh, we can meet halfway. If, if the church, the religion can become more open and inclusive in, in, in that manner, like it has been in Latin America and Africa, I think a religion can also play a very positive role in the Middle East and in the Balkans, Europe, where it also actually was more divisive than uniting. Why do countries and people respond quickly and generously to events like the tsunami or the earthquakes, but not to events like Darfur? I think there are two reasons. One is 
the degree of media attention, which again is connected to the, the whole point that some are, as we call it, sudden onset, dramatic thing. The other one is a slow onset thing that go, it builds over months, and you don't quite notice it before it is too late in a way. Uh, you know, these images that were on all the television screen taken by tourists in Thailand of the wave made it more than easy for me to say, listen, we have to look at your TV screens, look at the drama, pay up. It, 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 it was very easy. However, to say then, you know, there has been a war in Colombia now for 45 years, you know, help us there. People say, no, that's a black hole. I want to give my money to something which is a drama of today where I can help people come back to, to tomorrow. So that is why it's so important that we also not only give from our pockets when we hear of a drama, we also give as, as taxpayers to funds that are administered by people who have as a job to look at needs worldwide. And the emergency relief fund that I created in the UN is now using Congo at its number one beneficiary because there the lives, there the needs are the greatest measured by all standards at the moment. Question from one of the high school students in the audience today. What was it like negotiating with guerrillas and warlords in Sudan? Well, it was, uh, it was interesting, uh, to put it mildly. <clears throat> It's also very challenging. Uh, it is uh, morally, politically, physically, uh, mentally very challenging. Of course, they know that I know that they know that I want to see them in jail after, <laughs> uh, after the negotiations end. But they also know that I know that they sit with the the key to unlock the situation for people who are suffering. So I was criticized at times, how can you go and shake, the, and, and, and shake the hand of this mass murderer? And then I basically said, because of two things, he needs to hear the truth as we know it of, of, of what we hold him accountable for. And secondly, he needs to hear a, a, the exact um, demand of how to release prisoners, how to stop attacking, and thirdly, of our prescription for how they can exit this vicious, uh, this vicious uh, cycle. So, so you, you have, in a way, to speak to very bad people if you are to help the victims in the depths of hell, really. You care to comment on the recent situation in Kenya? Was it predictable? Could something have been done to prevent the violence that broke out? Any comments on the UN participation in settling the conflict? Kenya was very predictable. There's basically been that kind of violence nearly every election in Kenya, and much between the same ethnic groups. Kikuyus, which are in, uh, uh, around um, Nairobi, and Luo people who are to the west and into the Rift Valley. Um, <laughs> how could, could it have been prevented? Yes, I think it could more have been prevented, but it's interesting. The Kenya story is more a story, actually, of the world reacting early for once. I mean, not a prevention, but early intervention. My, my chief and boss, uh, over many years, Kofi Annan was a graduate of McAllister University in, in, in town, was sent there very early with UN mediators, and now there is a real chance that it is over for this time. But it will be back in next election unless there is more presence earlier, and, and you really f make all of these people who want to in ignite the fire, make them feel watched. In your estimation, where are the next uh, catastrophes, political or otherwise, that we might be challenged with in the world stage? 
Well, as I hinted, uh, the, the one, um, the, 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 the big time bomb that can go off big or can also be actually prevented is, is climate change. There is, it, it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer, and it will have dramatic, for example, one of the dramatic effects is that the ice on Greenland and, and Antarctica is starting to melt, which will mean higher uh, waters, uh, sea rise, which is the end of se several island states as we knew them, but also of large coastal areas being flooded, like Bangladesh and so on, and tens of millions of people uh, being displaced. Um, in polit uh, you know, the, the war that is getting worse and not better now is the Darfur, Chad, Central African Republic war. It's now a regional war. And I also am very uh, nervous for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Gaza is smaller than the municipality of Oslo. Be, I don't know, like the city, the, it's, it's an area like the Twin Cities, I suppose, where you lock in 1.6 million people Half of them, youth, with no economy, no education, no uh, higher education possibilities, and no hope. It will lead to a boiling extremism and violence unless it is, it, it is dealt with in a durable, peaceful, secure solution, both for Israelis and Palestinians. If the UN gave you a special assignment to go into Israel and Palestine to negotiate, how would you begin that process? Uh, well, I had a, um, I, I, although I, I tried to do that uh, myself for years. The little Norway failed because we had, we couldn't force anybody to do anything that they didn't want. What we managed to do was to, to establish a secret, good, professional, effective peace channel. Well, what I would do, uh, well, number one, I would secure long-term, sustained, uh, a long-term sustained effort by the United States, which is the most effective one to put some leverage on the parties, carrot and stick, which is needed in, in, in this conflict. Europeans cannot do it for the historic reasons or going all back to the Holocaust and so on. Uh, <clears throat> the Egypt, is the second actor, very important for the Palestinians. So the UN, together with, in my view, uh, United States and Egypt, could do it, and we would then do it in a 10-year effort where we would ask the leaders on both sides to come above the, the, the reactive mode, let's now, let's now have revenge for what happened last night, and, and basically chart out hope for the youth of the region. That's the only way as I, as I see it. Can you describe the perception of America that you encounter around the world in the various conflicts and other areas where you've been working on behalf of the United Nations? Well, the, the perception, um, number one, I mean, you sh will be pleased to know that everybody knows, knows about you. I've often noted that they haven't even heard about Norway. Uh, but the, the difference is, of course, that if they have heard about Norway, it's usually pretty positive, you know, I, either exotic positive or, or that they heard uh, done some, some good. Um, of course, uh, the whole war on terror has made the United States relapse a lot in terms of, it's not just my observation, I mean, you see countries like Turkey or Jordan, which are strategic in terms of combating terrorism, it's hardly possible to see on public opinion polls people who support the way that the effort against terror is undertaken by the West. And that's, to me, that's a wake-up call. Um, the, the, the U.S., has been doing and is doing so much good that 
in a way, it's, it's, it's similar to some of the UN problems. I mean, the UN has an enormous public perception problem in large parts of the US. UN is seen as ineffective, corrupt, uh, anti-Israeli, anti-American, whereas the US is not seen by all of the good things it's doing. It's seen as being, you know, um, biased, not cooperating, not listening. And, and, and that, uh, that, is, uh, that is a challenge, of course. That will be a challenge for, for the new president coming in. Any comments on the possibilities that the UN can, in fact, restructure and become uh, more effective and more competent in its work? Yeah, I, I, I'm a big believer in radical UN reform in many areas. The UN is doing very many great things, which I detail in my, in my book, and I mention all of these peace, successful peace processes, relief uh, efforts, etc. But it's rather in spite of the structure than because of the structure and the methods and the rules. Just mention two things. The way the Security Council, which is really the, the board of the organization, the way that board is reflected is, you know, how the world was in 1945. I mean, some of you here will remember 1945 and that some won and some lost a world war. But in a way, who cares in 2008, you know, what was the result of the Second World War in terms of the need to solve Darfur, Zimbabwe, and that kind of, of, of situations. And we, if India is to be held accountable as an economic superpower, and soon the most populous country on Earth, and it would have one billion inhabitants more than the United States in 15 years from now, you know, it must be able to have a membership on the main body of the UN, and, and it doesn't even have that. Secondly, the UN is, is, is ineffective in the sense that it takes a year to fill a post. It's supposed to be so transparent, so open, so according to the book, it takes a year to fill a post even in in emergency of, of, uh, organizations like my own. The Secretary General cannot move a post from A to Z within his own organization because of all of the rules that the member states have enacted on, on their uh, own secretariat. Other than heads of state, please name three people I should watch who could help move peace along. Yeah, ooh, uh, except for heads of states, uh, ooh. no, I, uh, well, I, let's, uh, I, I don't necessarily know if I have names. I, I would watch some of the most important religious leaders, including the Shia and Sunni leaderships in several countries, and Christian and Jewish leaderships. That's, that's w w the kind of signals they give are very important. Back to the question of, of, of religion. What about to, uh, from the world of, of artists, musicians, yeah, cultural then, I, mean, I mean, of course, it was, it was very, I, I think it was a, a real event when Steven Spielberg said, I will, not, I will not direct the opening of the Olympics because I think China could do more in Darfur. I think that was, I think that was positive. I would not ask the poor American athletes who have been you know, exercising for 10 years to do good in Beijing, to step out now because of the fall. But I think, I mean, a man like Spielberg has a real uh, say. Many of the Amer Americans, uh, that's, uh, that's of course what you should be proud of America, that you have so many um, uh, leaders, thinkers, artists, cultural people that has worldwide recognition. No other nation is, is even close to have that. As you know, we're in the midst of the presidential campaign here. What should we most ask, ask or expect of the candidates who are vying for nomination regarding international and humanitarian affairs? Well, I think it's, I, I would hope that you ask them a lot about, about international questions regarding uh, cooperation, partnership, human rights. 
and, and, and international assistance. You know, um, Senator Obama came to my office to discuss Darfur in the United Nations in 2005 or 6. Uh, in 2002, I was invited to Senator McCain's office to discuss Colombia and the war and the peace effort and the drug problem. And of course, I worked very closely with uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton on the tsunami reconstruction effort. So my sense is that all of these three candidates is, is very aware of the importance of international cooperation. I would also uh, personally say the following. In issues like the use of torture or maltreatment, and we're now back to the war on terror, I, I think we have in the West to take the moral high ground and do like George Washington did in the war against the British. He said the following, let to all of the free American forces, he said, let there be no maltreatment of the British prisoners of ours like they are maltreating our prisoners on the other side. And Abraham Lincoln said exactly the same during the Civil War. Uh, now it's been said, even from the White House, we may have to go over to the dark side, this is the quote, in terms of, uh, of, of, of um, getting information and, and, and prisoner interrogation. I, th I think that's wrong. It is, uh, it is precisely in a way showing that we're not a moral alternative to despicable terror, which is precisely known because it is doing, it, it is fighting, it is uh, civilians, and it is ruthlessly employing violence outside of, of international, uh, international laws. So I, I'd, I'd say uh, on this one, uh, it's very, very important that, that there is a very strong signal that this is a quest for human rights and human dignity. Thank you, Jan Eglin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.